Good evening once again, students, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Arthur Johnson speaking to you from the safety of my desk at home, and I trust that you are all in good and safe places as we hunker down and get through this uh, situation. Uh, but let's, let's not dwell on that. There's enough talk of that elsewhere. We'll talk tonight instead about things to do with astronomy, and in particular, it's tonight that we're going to speak something about cosmology, uh, the study of where we are and how our home on the earth fits into the greater scheme of things. It's a worthy question and one that's been thought about by many, many folks. Cosmology, how big is the universe? What is our place in it? And other philosophical questions that go along. Now, close to Reno, uh, down in Mono County, California, there's a cave been discovered where some Native Americans, I think Northern Paiutes, made drawings on a cave wall that suggested their interest in cosmology. Uh, the Native American peoples typically believed in three or four or five different levels. Humans were on one, the spirits were above, and evil forces were below. This is not a great study of mine. I'm not a huge expert on Native American cosmology, but I wanted to mention it first because sometimes when we read Western history, we think we've got it all figured out, and uh, not necessarily. The Hindus believed the earth was uh, carried on the backs of elephants, who in, in turn were standing on the back of a tortoise. Uh, some had the tortoise or turtle swimming in a great ocean. Variations on this could be found, but it was at least a way of explaining or, or accounting for the human experience on the earth. Here is a fun woodcut that I used to uh, speak about in my days of planetarium lecturing. Uh, we have, I don't know if you can see my laser pointer, but here's some man who has climbed a high mountain. Here's the sun and the dome of the heavens and the philosopher or shepherd or whoever has uh, poked his head through uh, past the dome of the heavens and is able to see all those mysterious things uh, that make the heavens work. Now, here's a couple of things that no good universe should be without. We've got a couple of wagon wheels up here, maybe some heads of cabbage down here, a few clouds, who knows. But anyway, early civilizations tended to imagine the Earth as what it looked to be to the naked eye. It looked like a flat surface, and so we had a flat Earth, and all of the things in the sky were whirling around. Aristotle and his disciple Ptolemy, who was flourishing in Greece around the year 130 uh, AD, thought that the Earth was, of course, at the center. There were various spheres, crystalline spheres, to which were affixed the planets, and the outermost sphere was the sphere where the stars were attached. And maybe you've heard the term seventh heaven. Well, we have the sphere of the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, and so forth, on out to seventh heaven, which is where resided the fixed stars, the nature of which nobody knew and did not worry about greatly, since, after all, we were at the center of things right here on the earth. Well, in the 1400s, along came Nicholas Copernicus, who was a mathematician and philosopher, and he had quite a different idea. In his concept, uh, the sun was at the center of the universe, and the Earth and its orbiting moon were going around the sun, as were all the other planets. It was a little uh, demeaning to our sense of importance, but um, some people began to pick this up as possibly the truth. Here it is again, the uh, concept of the sun at the center, orbit of Mercury, Venus, moon orbiting the Earth, then the orbits of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then finally, outside of that, the sphere of the fixed stars. So this was the Copernican system, which came in for huge criticism, particularly from the religious authorities, uh, and it caused some trouble for this fellow, Galileo. He was not the inventor of the telescope, but was for sure the first to use it for astronomical purposes. And in this wonderful painting, uh, here he is holding his spyglass uh, which he used to make tremendously important discoveries in astronomy. Not the least of which was his discovery that Jupiter has its own set of moons that orbit around it. 
Here are some drawings from the year 1609. And you can see from January 10th to 11th to 12th, he plotted a picture of Jupiter, and you notice that the little accompanying stars danced around Jupiter, but always stayed with it. And to uh, him, uh, to Galileo, this was a powerful demonstration that seemed to accord with the Copernican view of things. Well, he got himself in deep trouble, um, had to be hauled before the Inquisition uh, in Rome and was shown the instruments by which he would be tortured if he did not recant. And so he did uh, withdraw his, his embracing of the Copernican theory, but uh, he went to his death still persuaded that he was right. Here is a manuscript with some drawings of Jupiter in Galileo's own handwriting. So with the coming in of this view, the big insight was, of course, Earth is no longer in the center of everything, but, well, at least the sun is, and we're not all that far away from the sun, right? So maybe we can feel a little bit of consolation. But uh, this view was not to hold forever. At the end of the time of Galileo, on into the later 17th and 18th centuries, astronomers made discoveries that made it look more and more as if we were not exactly at the center of the universe. Let's see what they were. The notion came to be accepted that the stars are other suns, that our sun is just one star among many. But how many, and how far, and how big is the universe now? Well, to answer this question, there was an English astronomer named William Herschel. Uh, I'm an amateur musician. Well, I've been a professional musician, but, uh, too, but he, was, he started out his life as an organist and composer, uh, but then he got into astronomy big time, got some small telescopes, and one night in 1781, he just happened to find a planet. Nobody ever thought that another planet could exist beyond Saturn, but in uh, 1781, he discovered a pale little planet that was named Uranus. Uh, he at first attempted to name it for his patron, King George III, but later that was brushed away. However, George was flattered and appointed Herschel as court astronomer in 1782, that let Herschel quit his music gigs and concentrate full-time on the world of astronomy. And the king also assisted Herschel in the acquisition and building of bigger and bigger telescopes. Here's one with a mirror 40 inches in diameter, quite, a, quite a, an advance from the little uh, optical tube that you saw Mr. Galileo holding a few minutes ago. Well, Herschel made lots of discoveries, uh, but one that is germane to what I want to tell you about tonight, was the discovery of the shape of the universe. He was interested in studying how many stars he could see if he pointed his telescope in all the possible directions. He called this enterprise stargauging, and he made something like 683 probes looking in a very specific direction all around the sky, and with the same eyepiece, he counted how many stars he would be able to see through his telescope with that one eyepiece looking in all these different directions. He recorded his results, and based on them, he made this plot of what he thought the universe must be like. He described it in his writing as being shaped like a grindstone or a wheel, and here we are seeing it uh, edge on. So here's the long axis of the grindstone, and this would be looking out. He thought, by the way, that we were at the center of the grindstone. Well, does that sound familiar? Anyway, when you look at the Milky Way in summer or winter, you know this from experience, that you see lots and lots of stars in this direction or in that direction. But when you look at right angles to the Milky Way, you see fewer stars. So we judge today that uh, Herschel got it right in at least broad strokes of the brush. He did conceive that the star system of which the sun forms a part is in the shape, roughly, of a big wheel or grindstone. Now, how do you measure the distance 
to another star. Not terribly obvious, but uh, I can give you an example of the basic technique, and you need do nothing any more than simply to hold out your hand in front of your face, wherever you happen to be, and then look at your hand in relation to something in, in the background. I'm looking at a couple of pictures on the wall of my studio right now. So here we have viewpoint A, viewpoint B, and the object we're looking at. In the case of me right now, viewpoint A is my left eye, viewpoint B is my right eye, and the object is my thumb. So as I blink from one eye to the other, and you should try this, nobody's going to be laughing at you, don't worry, uh, you'll see that your thumb is going to seem to jump back and forth against the background that's on your wall or across your room. So this is a very simple demonstration of a concept called parallax. It's an exercise in geometry. We are constructing a triangle, and by switching our viewpoint, we see the object under study seem to shift back and forth. Well, now fast forward and make it a very much bigger picture. What we have here, instead of your left eye, is the Earth's position in its orbit, let's say in the month of December. Remember that it is 93 million miles from the Earth to the Sun. So over here we have the Earth in, say, June, almost six months later, and it is now twice 93 million miles from where we used to be to where we are now. So if you took a picture of some nearby star in December, you would record that star's position against the background star. Come back half a year later, take a picture of that near, nearby star once again, and you will see that it has shifted against the background stars. Now, the angle by which it shifts is called the angle of parallax. And in practice, it's a really, really tiny angle. Even the biggest parallax, which is shown by the closest star, Alpha Centauri, is less than one arc second. So it's a tiny, tiny angle, and you can't really measure it with amateur quality, amateur sized telescopes. But with big instruments, it's possible. And starting in about 1837, uh, parallax got measured for the first time. The star was called 61 Cygni, uh, and it uh, doesn't matter. It's not quite as close as Alpha Centauri, but. Uh, this technique of taking pictures of an interesting star at six-month intervals allows us to measure the tiny shift they undergo against the stellar background, and so we can calculate through geometry and trigonometry the actual distance. So the first uh, star was 61 Cygni, soon Alpha Centauri was measured at four and a third light years away. It's still the closest star system known. But parallax can be used to measure distances to other stars out first to hundreds of light years away uh, with ground-based techniques. And then in the space age, using uh, telescopes on satellites that were above Earth's troubling atmosphere, it became possible to measure parallaxes, much, much tinier angular shifts. And now we can go out to a few thousands of light years. There is an orbiting um, observatory called Hipparchos, which has been doing this, and there's a still later one whose name I'm not coming up with now, but I, I'll give it to you later. Uh, we can now get out to thousands of light years. So Herschel studies began to suggest that the universe was the shape of a grindstone, and indeed we think it is. We think that this picture, uh, which is actually the Andromeda galaxy, is a pretty good representation of what our own Milky Way galaxy would look like if we could get far enough away. We used to think, up until just a few months ago, that it was about 150,000 light years from one side of the galaxy to the other. A very recent paper out of Europe uh, suggests that that's too small by a factor of maybe 20. But anyway, here it is. Here's Herschel's grindstone. Um, great swirling pinwheel of stars with a bulge in the center. By the way, this is a satellite galaxy, as is this. 
this Andromeda galaxy has two satellites, as does our own Milky Way, but I'm jumping ahead. As the 19th century turned to the 20th century, telescopes were getting better, photography was on the scene, and it too was getting better, and astronomers studying the universe saw a great many objects that looked like the Andromeda spiral. Mind you, Andromeda was referred to at this time as the Andromeda Nebula. Nebula is a Latin word that means cloud, and people thought that it was just a cloud of gas or maybe gas and stars, but it was contained within our grindstone universe. And here's a picture taken right around the turn of the 20th century at Lick Observatory near San Jose, California, and you can see lots of fixed stars, but you can also see these smudgy things, and some of them look like pinwheels, right? So all of these spiral nebulae started to be known to astronomers. Here are some modern color pictures. These are Hubble pictures of various spiral nebulae. I'm going to keep that name until a little bit later because nobody was quite ready to accept that these things were outside of our own universe, outside of our home grindstone, right? So here are many, many examples of galaxies. They are spirals. They have spiraled arms, spiral-shaped arms. Some of them we see face-on, some at an oblique angle. And most all of them have a bulge at the center, and you'll also notice yellow color. We know that the physical nature of the stars near the galactic center is quite different from the ones out in the arms. More about that some other time. Here's another spiral nebula seen very nearly edge on, and you can see dark lanes of gas and dust. And again, the bright galactic nucleus or core. Well, as the 20th century moved on, getting into the age of jazz in the 1920s, there were more and better telescopes on the scene. More and more of these spiral nebulae had been detected. And in 1920, there was a huge debate that was conducted in a very public meeting at the National Academy of Sciences between Harlow Shapley and Heber D. Curtis. You've probably heard the name Harlow Shapley. We don't remember Curtis's name as much, but we deserve to because he actually got it right. The debate that these learned men underwent was, what are these spiral nebulae? Harlow Shapley took the conservative view that was generally accepted. That the universe is simply one big galaxy. It's ours. We call it the Milky Way. And all those swirling spiral things belong to the Milky Way. Now, Heber Curtis took the opposite viewpoint. He said, no, our Milky Way looks like a spiral or a grindstone, but all those other spiral things are far, far beyond our Milky Way and our galaxies in their own right. Well, everybody in the audience who had thought about it for a little while realized the implications of Curtis's argument. If it were true, if all of those spiral nebulae were in fact other island universes, to use another term that prevailed at that time, then the universe would be hugely, unthinkably bigger than uh, than before, bigger than the prevailing view. Well, both men made pretty good arguments, and if you reread the proceedings of that meeting, they, they both were honest uh, brokers. They made arguments for their point of view, but it was not able to be resolved at that meeting. However, it wasn't very long before it did get resolved, and here comes uh, my plug for a book that I do not have any financial interest in, but I have a copy, and I am happily rereading it right now, and I do commend it to you as something that would be worth your attention. The Day We Found the Universe, Marcia Bartusiak, published in the year uh, 2009. So it's just been around 11 years. The inspiration for her title was exactly what that great debate was in 1920. What are those spiral nebulae? And 
her means to get at the answer is a little bit off the beaten track, and I need you to bear with me for one moment. She became interested in studying variable stars. Most stars in the galaxy keep a relatively constant brightness, but not all. There are thousands that change in brightness. These variable stars, some of them, are long period variables and unpredictable, largely unpredictable. Sometimes uh, they might vary by as much as two or three magnitudes from when they are at their brightest to when they're at their faintest. Those of you who were at our little observing session last month, can you both, no, February, <laughs> seems a long time ago, uh, will remember I remarked on the fact that Betelgeuse or Betelgeese in Orion is itself a variable star and actually underwent a dimming uh, in December and January, and now, by the way, is brightening back up. Well, Henrietta Leavitt, who was working at the Harvard College Observatory in Massachusetts, was particularly interested in a class of variable stars called the Cepheid variables, and they take their name from the constellation uh, Cephas, but never mind that. She looked at the clouds of Magellan, which are two objects that are very close to our own galaxy. We know them today to be the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Using good telescopes and good cameras, she studied hundreds and hundreds of Cepheid variables, and she knew that the ones she was looking at, was, I believe she was looking in the small Magellanic Cloud, they all had to be roughly at the same distance. They were out there where the small Magellanic Cloud was. And as she studied them, she came to quite an amazing discovery. The ones that pulsated fastest like a beating heart, the ones that went from bright to faint and back to bright again, in just a few days were dimmer than the others. And at the end of the other end of the scale, the Cepheid variables that took many months to go from bright to dim and back to bright again were intrinsically more luminous. In other words, the faint ones change quickly, the big bright ones change more slowly, and we actually have many light curves that bear this out, and in the last couple of decades, we have honored Henrietta Leavitt's uh, insight by referring to it as Leavitt's Law, and it has been demonstrated many, many times to be true. Now, you need to calibrate this, of course, by being able to find some nearby Cepheid variables that you can measure using parallax. Are you with me? So you take some nearby ones, make the parallactic measurement, which means geometry is telling you for sure how far away they are, and you use that to calibrate this entire predictive scheme. So fast forwarding now to the day we found the universe. Exactly what are we talking about? Well, the new 100-inch telescope had gone into stars within the Andromeda Nebula that turned out to be Cepheid variable stars. So the first one he saw is at the lower part of our picture here, Cepheid variable V1, right there it is. And he was able to photograph it on repeated occasions and was able to determine for sure uh, its period. And from that, he was able to determine intrinsically how bright it was. So this is important. Bear with me here. You know how bright it is intrinsically because you know how fast it's pulsing. You know how bright it looks and from Levitt's law you can then calculate if, if it looks that faint then it must be that far away. And his work told us that Remember now, that our galaxy was thought to be 150,000 light years across. He was able to demonstrate that this Andromeda Nebula lay at the impossible distance of 2.5 million light years. So from 150,000 to 2.5 million. So absolutely without question, he was able to state that the Andromeda object could properly be referred to as the Andromeda galaxy, nebula no more. And if our system had, as we think it has, a couple of hundred million stars in it, then by every, every extension and by every reason, 
you would find a similar number of stars in this galaxy and that galaxy and all the other spirals that you could see. And so this great debate, 1920, produced general agreement among people in a position to judge, and astronomy very quickly came to accept the idea that the universe in which we live is trillions, perhaps, of times larger than had been understood before. I will close with a quote, and I don't know the name of the author. I may be able to find it. But it's one that when I was a young man and giving lectures at the Griffith Observatory, we used to use in our lectures when we were going through material similar to what I just presented to you. And the quote is, is here. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches in the world. Our place in it is not the center. With that, I am going to conclude my PowerPoint and my video, and I will return to you live uh, to take your questions. So thank you very much. This is Arthur Johnson.